Put that coffee down. Coffee still closes on me. Welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm headquartered just outside Washington, D.C. We talk with some of America's most influential closers, from industry-leading CEOs to best-selling authors, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, as we take you on an informative, thought-provoking, and highly entertaining journey into the lives of highly successful, driven, and forward-thinking disruptors who are making a lasting impact in their field and on society. Joining us on this week's episode of Coffee with Closers is Steve Cohn. He is the head of communications, marketing, and philanthropy at Capital Caring Health, the largest not-for-profit provider of advanced illness care in greater Washington, D.C., It is also one of the 15 original hospice providers established in the United States. Hospice, which provides compassionate care for people in the last phases of an incurable disease, usually in the comfort of their own home, was created as a benefit in the US almost 50 years ago. It is also almost always completely covered by insurance. But as Mr. Cohn explains, it is often misunderstood and grossly underutilized especially among certain segments of the population. He also discusses the mission he is now on to help change the narrative so that the public and the medical community come to better understand and fully embrace the many benefits that hospice offers, including a better quality of life and in many cases, longer life expectancy for patients. Steve Cohn, welcome to Coffee with Closers. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with you, Steve. Yeah, great. And you're uh, just down the road, so, uh, yeah, exactly. so close. Um, all right, we've got a lot to get to today. We're going to talk about um, everything related to uh, hospice care. Uh, definitely want to get into uh, the work that you're doing at uh, Capital Caring Health, but I want to, let's just start with the basics yeah, um, sure. for, for our listeners and viewers. Um, what does it mean when someone is in hospice care? What is hospice care? Yes, yeah, so hospice care was created as a benefit um, 47 years ago in this country, and it was occurring in the UK many, many years before. So we basically imported the whole hospice care idea from um, the United Kingdom um, back in the late 70s. And legislation was passed in 1977, I believe, to make the hospice benefit real. And the hospice benefit is available for anyone living in the United States. They don't even have to be a citizen mm-hmm. um, who is deemed by two physicians, usually an attending physician and a hospice physician to best case have six months or less to live. Gotcha. And that allows them to be enrolled in the hospice care, which is almost always completely covered by insurance, either Medicare Medicaid or private insurance. And because Capital Caring Health, where I work, is a not-for-profit hospice organization, we pick up the tab, thanks to philanthropy, for people who, for one reason or another, aren't insured at all. Gotcha. Um, When people think of hospice care, um, I think there might be some notion generally in the population that it's elderly uh, individuals. But um, and we'll get to your work in just a minute sure. um, on on that front. But but really, it can be any age. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, not everyone who uh, is deemed terminally ill is elderly. Yeah, you know, uh, the three um, reminds me that that the three uh, biggest killers of people in the United States: number one is heart disease, yep. number two is cancer, and number three is dementia. Yeah. Of those three, cancer, unfortunately, of course, as we know, can affect people at any age. Gotcha. Uh, not just, for instance, 65 and over. Got it. How does hospice care differ from other end-of-life care uh, options or even settings? I know that there's uh, nursing homes, continuing care retirement communities, assisted living, there's palliative care. Um, can you just talk a little bit about maybe some of the, the high-level, uh, what's different? Right. Well, you um, when you mention all those um, alternatives, it uh, reminds me that people should know about when their loved one has best case, a few months left to live, 
there's really only two alternatives, regardless of where they live, whether it's in a residence or an assisted living facility or a nursing home. They can either enroll in hospice care, which not only cares for the patient, but the whole family, which we can talk about. Yep. The other option is hospitalization and usually repeated hospitalizations. Yep. Um, where tragically, the patient often dies alone. And also tragically, the family um, goes through a tremendous amount of stress, often much more than the patient, trying to go it alone, um, rushing someone to the ER, um, seeing their loved one, you know, hooked up to all kinds of, uh, you know, life-saving machines, often being over-medicated just because doctors are trying to cure them. And uh, where the solution is hospice care where the patient uh, was always made comfortable and pain-free in a familiar surrounding, most of the time in their home or wherever they reside. And it's far better for everybody mm -hmm. than trying to um, go it alone. Got it. Let's turn to your work. Um, so you are the head of communications, marketing, philanthropy at Capital Caring Health, a uh, non-for-profit community uh, provider of advanced illness, hospice, and elder care, including primary care at home for residents here in greater Washington, yes. uh, D.C. At a high level, just walk us through the history of the organization um, and, and the services you provide and to whom. Right. So um, among the people that got the hospice benefit uh, to become – um, law in the United States was um, a very good friend of mine and our former CEO, he's now chairman of the board, Tom Consumpus. So Tom and a few other people, including Senator Bob Dole, who was really the driving force uh, in Congress at the time, got the hospice benefit uh, created and adopted by Medicare uh, um, right around 1977. And that's when we started. So we were actually one of the Capital Caring Health was one of the first 15 hospice organizations to begin operation in the United States in 1977. And we also provide, um, well, uh, another, another point I should make is that about half of our patients on any given day are hospice patients, meaning best case, they have six months or less to live and they're enrolled in our hospice care. We also have um, a large number of uh, patients who are just chronically ill. They're not terminal. And that's where palliative care comes in and what we call primary care at home. And palliative care is for people who are chronically ill and mobile uh, who can come to one of our clinics and be cared for um, in that way. And, but if they're chronically ill and they tend to be elderly and they're homebound, then we come to them and provide um, medical, spiritual, social, uh, lifestyle care um, and try to help them through their chronic illness or multiple illnesses uh, and um, trying to improve their situation overall. Is palliative care, is it covered just like hospice? Yes, the vast oh. majority of uh, palliative care. Uh, there are some um, copay costs usually, okay, but not not to any exorbitant degree. And for palliative, not to get too far down this road, but I'm just curious, what? how do you... You talked about six months le or less to uh, and for life for hospice. Uh, what's the to to get palliative care? What is the? You just have to. What's the benchmark? Have a chronic illness. Just a chronic Ill illness. Yeah. Got it. There's no time frame. Got it. Um, talk a little bit about your care team. How is it made up, and and how are your services uh, delivered? Is it predominantly home? Is it facility? Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about that. About ninety five percent of the time, uh, for primary care at home and for hospice care, mm -hmm. it's delivered in the home. Right. Uh, or wherever they reside. So it can be an assisted living facility, it can be a nursing home as well. Uh, and um, we provide uh, a whole team that covers the medical as well as emotional needs of the patient and the family, mm -hmm. which is a huge benefit. We wish more people understood. So whether it's um, someone who's chronically ill or someone who's terminally ill, our team includes a physician. All these people are especially trained to be hospice uh, care providers. Mm -hmm. 
uh, several different types of nurses, a um, social worker, and if they would like, uh, a, a non-denominational chaplain. And we look at the whole lifestyle of the patient, whether it's hospice care or, or, or primary care at home. So we often find that when someone enters our hospice care that they've been over-medicated and it's actually reducing their, <laughs> their lifespan. And so, you know, we fix that. We also spend a lot of time with family members, if they have family, um, describing what's going to happen, best case, during the course of their last few months, um, what, you know, how they can cope with that. Um, and uh, we're always there for them. Um, so there's no need to be stressed out about what's happening. What's happening. We're always available by phone if we're not there physically. Yep. Um, and we care about the whole family situation. So what about diet? What about exercise for the patient as well as the family? Does the dog need walking? Yeah. Um, and it's very much worth pointing out that we also have a huge uh, cadre of fabulous volunteers that also um, are available to be there for the family and the patient. Um, and volunteers can bring food. They can bring uh, 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 drug deliveries if, um, if those are uh, necessary. Um, they can take care of, like I said, the pets. Um, and also we look to see if the home is, uh, is set up safety-wise so that the patient uh, won't fall or trip or somehow hurt themselves. Got it. So it's, I call it surround care. It's, yeah. it's way beyond just making them uh, comfortable and pain-free. Got it. For them and the family. Yeah. And it, I have to think at some level it brings uh, an element of uh, peace and control back to knowing that you're in, you know, you're in your home. And it, it just, that's a super point in, a, in hospice yeah. care, you, the patient and your family member or members are in control. You're not in a hospital where, you know, and it doesn't, that's not what a hospital is set up for. Um, they do the best they possibly can, but they're, they're not set up to take care of someone in their home. Uh, and to provide care way beyond just medical care. And hospitals are our biggest uh, uh, referral sources. Yeah. Because they don't want the patient to, you know, spend their last days, minutes in the hospital if, if they can help it. They can help it. You mentioned that uh, Capital Caring Health is the largest care provider on the East Coast for children with life-limiting disease. You want to talk correct. about that for a second? Right. So um, <clears throat> we... Uh, we are, uh, let's see, there's roughly 4,700 hospice organizations uh, in the U.S. We are one of only five organizations that has a dedicated pediatric hospice team of mm -hmm. doctors, nurses, social worker, chaplain, um, and specially trained volunteers. Uh, so other hospice groups can care for children, but they don't have a dedicated team that are specializing in children's hospice care. And so we provide that care for children uh, beyond our local service area, including, you know, our whole region because we're a specialist. Okay. And um, children's hospitals um, and other hospitals who wind up with children who are deemed terminally ill, the parents almost always want their child back home where we can, you know, care for them in a familiar surrounding in their, in their bedroom or another room that we set up. So whether it's for a child or an adult, um, it's not just um, providing, uh, you know, uh, painkillers like morphine. We also provide a hospital bed. We provide, you know, uh, intravenous equipment. Uh, we do ultrasound at the bedside, which is a pretty new um, um, element of what we do. And on that point, just, just for clarification, um, in terms of hospice versus hospitalization, what's not being given 
to the patient at home in hospice that they are given in the hospital. I assume like uh, chemo chemo treatments and, and those kind of things are, are right. So hospice care uh, for adults, not for children, not for yeah, but for adults. That means that we're not trying to cure them anymore. Right. We're just making them comfortable and completely pain free. Um, so the primary drug that's used for that is morphine. It's really um, our job to make sure that they're not in pain and they're not being um, over medicated at all, which can reduce their lives in their remaining months. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and that's been proven that people that enter hospice care sooner live longer yeah. and have a better quality of life, a much better quality of life. Yeah. What is the average uh, today, Today, uh, as you look across the landscape, what is the average hospice stay uh, for, for an individual with- Way term? too short. Way too short, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know uh, I mentioned you said it's, you just, know, it's just a few days. Two weeks or less. Two weeks or less, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, I want to zoom out just a little bit here. Um, I think Capital Caring Health, your team, you're sort of on a mission to sort of change some of the misconceptions about um, hospice care. I think your uh, CEO said in the Wall Street Journal uh, earlier this year, and I quote, people think hospice means you're giving up and going home to die. <laughs> um, uh, you're working hard to change that uh, perception that, that is out there. Um, how so? Well, as I like to say, um, entering hospice care does not mean you're giving up on life. What right. you're giving up on is a better quality of life proven yep. over and over and over again for an extended period of time. And look at former President Jimmy Carter as the best current example, right? Um, he thought he only had a few days to live when he entered hospice care. But the hospice care probably allowed him to feel better about his situation, didn't want to be in a hospital room, and his whole mental attitude you know, changed for the better. Um, and that's what happens with hospice patients. And as a result, they live longer. And we know that the mind has a big effect on, you know, um, physiological issues that you're dealing with. So according to the... Um National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, NHPCO. Um, I saw a stat, I think it was uh, 2020, just 50.7% of Medicare uh, decedents were enrolled in hospice at the time of their death. Here in Washington, D.C., the district ranks as the second worst in the nation. Terrible. For utilization of hospice <laughs> it's care. It's absolutely terrible. Yeah, with only about 27% of eligible individuals choosing to enroll in hospice services. Why is the problem so acute here? Well, I don't, I don't mean a problem. I meant, you know, what, why, why do you think enrollment is not being utilized? Um, Washington, D.C. specifically has a large uh, community of color mm -hmm. and a large um, gay community. Mm -hmm. And both uh, traditionally and unfortunately, in my opinion, have a huge mistrust of being treated equitably and fairly um, in the medical system. And so hospice is part of the medical world, and that's how they view it. Um, and also, I think um, um, people of color and people in the LGBTQ um, community um, don't necessarily like the idea of um, strangers coming into their homes. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, um, Actually, among people of color, so black, Hispanic, Asian, American, uh, primarily those three groups. Asian Americans have the lowest by far hospice utilization because they are so adamant about we don't want people we don't know in our homes yeah. taking care of our loved ones. And there are very uh, culturally family is the, the center of, of. Correct. Yeah. I think there's also a misconception mm -hmm. and um, um, among the, the church going um, folks uh, in the district, for instance, that, um, you know, um, if they enter hospice care somehow, their spiritual um, leader, their pastor, their minister 
uh, can't be with them. And so that's something I wish people understood is not the case. If you're in hospice care, you can get visited by anyone you want at any time. Right. At any hour of the day or night. Um, so um, if you have a spiritual advisor, they're more than welcome. If you have uh, uh, another doctor that you would just like to see, that's perfectly okay. Yeah. We don't exclude anybody from being visited by anybody they want. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And when I, and I assume when you talk about the religious community, you're just talking about de- denominations just broadly. So right. Broadly. Any denomination. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that goes way beyond Christian and, and, and Jewish. Mm-hmm. It can be Muslim. It can be Hindu. We, we understand um, how to deal with uh, all of these uh, religions in terms of end of life, in terms of what happens when the per- person actually dies. Yeah. Um, and what are the requirements that that religion has for taking care of them and their family when, they're, when they die. Yeah. What, um, is there a segment of the population or area of the country where utilization is actually the highest? And if so, what, what, any lessons to be learned? Well, it's never been great. Never been great, but you know, uh, better than here. And I'd be curious to know what that group is, who that group is and, and maybe lessons learned. Well, um, Utah, for some reason, uh, has the best hospice utilization rate in the nation. Wow. And I think California is right up there. And Florida is number two, I think. Okay. Um, and California is not too far behind. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but even in those three states, uh, the majority of hospice qualified people never enroll. So it never gets over 50%, even in, in the best states. I will point out as well that a challenge that the hospice uh, movement has in um, other than DC, which is <laughs> certainly not rural, um, but uh, other states that have very low hospitalization, Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, or uh, Idaho, very rural and therefore hard to get to the patient or for the patient to get to us. And so that's a challenge that, you know, we're trying to pay more attention to as a movement. Having said all that, you're in the midst of a awareness campaign here in greater Washington to change the narrative. Yes. So talk to us a little about what that entails. What the, what is your, um, what is your message to the district? So after 47 years of providing hospice care to the district, it's disconcerting as we just talked about yeah. that the utilization rate is the second worst in the nation. And so um, we are, we Capital Caring Health is the beneficiary of a f- lovely grant from the Washington Home Foundation, which has a long history here since 1899. Uh, so we've received a grant from them to, and we're now running through December, a multimedia campaign uh, targeting DC residents to educate them about all the reasons why hospice care is so much more beneficial for them and their family than going it alone. And that's, um, we're also targeting uh, certain uh, TV and radio and newspapers that cater to people of color. Uh, We're using bus signage and bus transit stop signage. Um, And um, we hope that this very concentrated multimedia effort will result in two things happening. One, the average hospice stay in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, will increase. We, we'd like to see it go from, you know, a week or so to a month. That would be real success. And the other, um, the other thing that we would love to see um, is that 50%. So our goal is move from one week to one month for average hospice stay. And try to get 50% of the people that are not enrolled ordinarily in hospice care to enroll. Do hospitals help? And are there campaigns within hospitals that 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 make people aware of this uh, of this benefit? Uh, I don't know if I'd call it a campaign, but yeah. hospital staffs are very attuned to yeah awareness. I guess is the word. Yeah, I, I mean um, hospital staffs. Um, 
dealing with people who um, they think um, are really close to being terminal, uh, at least in our service area here, they're very uh, attuned to the fact that hospice care should be yeah. talked about with the patient and the family and utilized if at all possible. And we work very closely with all the hospitals in our, in our service area. We talked about hospice care in terms of coverage, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, are there any services not covered by private insurance, uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid? That, in the well, um, there's a term called concurrent care. Mm -hmm. So if someone's enrolled in hospice, unless they're a child, but if they're an adult, um, all concurrent care is not allowed to happen. So we're not trying to cure anymore. Right. But if the patient and family want curing to continue, they can pay for it. Yeah. But it, it would be an expense uh, on their part. It wouldn't be covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. But just to be clear, <clears throat> if they want to receive treatment to get better, you can't be both hospice and that, right? Or you... Yeah, you can be in hospice care and you can also demand to have curative care at your expense. At your expense. But, you know, I, I like to remind people that generally, and, and you know, um, I'm not a, a physician, so I can't say this definitively other than I hear this all the time. And we see evidence of this, that trying to cure people who are deemed terminal can often reduce their the days that they have left um, because at some point chemotherapy is counterproductive mm -hmm. as well as other types of treatments. Um, let's switch. I want a couple more questions. I'll be mindful of your time. I want to talk about, um, go back to capital caring health. You've got some innovative programs and resources going on now. Um, and I'd love to hear just kind of what you have uh, new going on at the company. I understand you have a robotic pet <laughs> therapy program for uh, veterans and patients with uh, dementia and pediatric patients. Um, tell us about that. That's Yeah, that really, is very close to my heart. That's really uh, great. Something that I kind of spearheaded um, now almost two years ago. Okay. Um, because um, I had uh, heard about this robotic uh, pet manufacturer when I was... Uh, before I came to Capital Caring Health and I was at AARP. And so when I came to Capital Caring Health, um, I was aware that these robotic pets were available and that there had been a number of clinical studies showing how introducing a dementia sufferer to a robotic pet could very often dramatically, and I repeat, dramatically improve their daily life. Wow. And their personality often changes from angry, confused, non-responsive, hallucinating, or all of the above, unfortunately, to very often calm, happy, um, much more um, socially um, outward to anyone they come in contact with who are care caring for them, uh, just by introducing this pet. Yeah. Which um, they view as theirs to take care of, so it gives them a sense of purpose and I always make the point that these robotic pets are not for a group of dementia patients. They're for a patient. A patient, yeah. They often name them almost always. They almost always keep them with them around the clock. Free of charge? Yes. Well, yeah. thanks to donat donations, um, we provide these to any uh, family that contacts us, whether they have a veteran, loved one, or a non-veteran, uh, who says that uh, their loved one is suffering from dementia, uh, including, of course, Alzheimer's. And um, we have dogs, we have cats, and we have birds. That's wild. And they respond just like real pets to sight, sound, and touch. So they're very lifelike. We're not trying to fool anybody. But the vast majority of the time, they're viewed as, this is my pet. This is my cat. This is my dog. We have singing and chirping birds now, too. And um, they're very lifelike and they respond like a real pet, except you don't have to care for them. Um, and those folks that have advanced dementia shouldn't be handling real pets. If they're in a facility, they probably aren't allowed to have real pets. And so this is a wonderful solution. 
That's great. And does the um, do the patients get to keep the pet for as long as they wish? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's that's amazing. And sometimes they want more than one. Someone wants a dog and a cat. That's fine. Uh, uh, it's, I call it low cost, high impact. Yeah. So everybody wins. Everybody wins. Oh, and and more often than not, medications can be reduced. Think about that. Just because they're handed this pet. That is fascinating. All right, zooming out just a bit here. Um, you mentioned that hospice provides huge savings for Medicare well, in a conversation you, know, you and I yes. had. Um, I think I Did saw, I say huge? Yes. Uh, well, maybe you didn't say the <laughs> no, word huge. huge. I agree with yeah, that. Yeah, 3.5. I agree with my former statement. Yeah, 3.5 billion in savings to Medicare in 2019, according to one stat that I saw. Um, and I think that's low. Yeah, okay. So maybe I maybe that's but low. But that's what, the, the, that was one study that came out. So in light of all the downward economic pressures facing the U.S. health system, today. Um, how is hospice care viewed by healthcare delivery stakeholders, particular providers? Are, are doctors and frontline physicians, are, are they strong advocates for hospice? Do they need to be stronger? They need to be stronger. And that reminds me to refer back to your question about our DC hospice awareness campaign that's going on right now. Yeah, We're actually um, targeting two groups of people in that campaign. One, you and I talked about, Steve, which yeah. are, um, I might not have said this, but it's um, anyone who lives in a district who's 45 and older, plus what we talked about, people of color and um, the LBGTQ uh, community, okay? Mm -hmm. That's one whole group. The other group are physicians, um, administrators of medical facilities, and pastors. So medical influencers. And yes, not all physicians um, understand uh, hospice care uh, the way they should or have misconceptions or have resistance for some reason. So they need to be educated as well. As a matter of fact, uh, one example is um, I've run across this repeatedly. Um, a lot of uh, folks in the medical community outside of hospice don't think that Dementia is a hospice-related disease when it is. Interesting. So, you know, um, as, a, as is any disease, including well, neurological. Why do they feel that way? They just don't know. They're not trained. Yeah. Um, people don't go into the medical profession, whether they're physicians or nurses, thinking, I want to be around people who are dying. I'm supposed to be, uh, I want to be in the medical profession to help people get better. And so... They, they, don't, they don't really understand that at the end of life, getting better means not being in the hospital, not being in the hospital, being at home. So it's, it's an education that needs to happen with the medical community as much as, um, yeah. you know, the consumer. As you look across the hospice landscape today and tomorrow, um, is there anything that keeps you and your team and other leaders in your organization and movement? What what keeps you got? What keeps you up at night? That may be beyond misconceptions around what it is, what it isn't. Um, what's your What's your greatest fear? Um, it's really just um, people at all levels, including um, politicians, not understanding the huge benefit of hospice care. And in, um, in the case of the patient and family, we've talked about all of that here today. But it's also true that, in my opinion, and I'm not alone in this opinion, private insurers, Medicare and Medicaid can save billions upon billions of dollars a year if people use and, and embrace hospice care versus hospitalizations that can be so much more expensive and also often counterproductive at the end of life. You know, these programs, if you look at the expenditure for just Medicare, it doubles every few years. Yeah. And with the aging of baby boomers, that's, <laughs> that's continuing. Yeah. It just goes straight up. Goes straight up. Yeah. And so, you know, I would think that um, our political friends uh, at the state and federal level um, uh, would want to encourage their constituencies to understand and embrace hospice care. 
I wish we kind of had an advocate like Senator Bob Dole was way back at the beginning. Yeah. Someone who really, um, whether he's he or she's in the House or the Senate, who can really help us um, get their colleagues and Americans to understand this is a major benefit and everybody wins, including yeah. these programs that are spiraling out of control cost-wise. Yeah. Speaking of that, one of your one of your hats is uh, chief of philanthropy. Um, I think you mentioned, and I think I saw it on a news report. You spend between two and three million dollars each year on, on the uninsured. Yes. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities with raising the the capital and the funds that that are needed to uh, do the work that you do? Well, um, raising money is never easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're a not for profit of any kind. Yeah. <clears throat> but in our case, um. We get a lot, a great deal of our support from what I would call grateful families. Yep. So family members who had a loved one in our care, whether yep. it's capital carrying's care or, you know, around the around the United States, our 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 sister not for profit organizations. A lot of our philanthropy dollars come from grateful families. Yeah. And um. And also. Um, and, and part of that also is from uh, bequests. Mm -hmm. uh, so we rely upon bequests uh, as well as outright donations. And then businesses and foundations who are healthcare focused uh, also contribute quite a bit. Gotcha. So uh, that's really um, our approach. Uh, we, but um, it's also... Uh, really heartening to see a program like the robotic pet program because that brings in people to give us help with um, being able to provide these pets free of charge uh, because of dementia. It's not about dying. Right, right. Yeah. So we've gotten a lot of new sources of revenue from individual businesses and foundations for the robotic pet program. And by the way, that program also – spins off some dollars that go into our charity care fund. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's that's just a very nice thing that uh, I see other hospice groups emulating, and I hope they continue to do that. Great. So um, how do residents in greater Washington learn more about Capital Caring Health? Where can they go? Uh, CapitalCaring.org. Yep. And uh, your 24-7 operation. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. All of us are. Yeah. Um, there, there's uh, no holiday shutdown. Yeah, that's why. That's um, great. And um, you uh, know, people need us when they need us. Yeah, that's great. Steve Cohn, thank you for joining Coffee with Closers before we, uh, before we end the show. Is there anything um, you wanted to add that I didn't ask you? I just appreciate the forum because the more that we can get out the message of this amazing benefit that everyone who lives in the United States Yeah has available to them and their loved ones, yeah. um, including people that live alone. Um, if they don't have a family, that's why we, partly why we have volunteers to become part of their temporary family. Yeah. So um, it's just a fabulous thing in America um, so that the patient has not only control, the patient family has control of their end of life, but dignity. Yeah. Um, in the setting they want to be in. Yeah, that's great. Well, Steve, thanks so much, and uh, <clears throat> continue all continue the good work that uh, you and your team do every day. So my pleasure. Thank th you. Thanks Steve. for joining us. A B C A always B B C closing always be closing always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.